Sean Fletcher. Uh, and without further ado, Sean Fletcher. Uh, hi, thank you for being inside here on a beautiful Friday. Uh, I, uh, I, have take, I have acquired a very bad habit of not um, pushing off till the last minute preparing for public talks and lectures. I didn't break that habit this time. I swore I, I was in the the I was in urgent care with a seven year old last night, so that was the nail in the coffin. It turned out there was nothing wrong with it. Um, um, and I had started to prepare some slides and things, um, but but they weren't any good. So I'm just going to talk. I do have written notes. So I wanted to talk well about the same thing that, that Socrates talked about before he um, was put to death. Um, and yeah, I don't stand in one place. Um, and um, and so my slides had started with this with this famous um, David's famous painting of uh, the death of Socrates, and then a word bubble appeared. Um, and Socrates said, um, "This is just too cheesy to do." So I just read it. Um, um, so Socrates, as you may know, was put to death for being impious and for corrupting the youth. And <coughs> Hemlock, so here he is about to take the, the poison. Um, and the, the painting, which I, which I used to teach in my introductory courses, is laden with symbolism. If you're familiar with the, with the dialogue, the garment falling off of him as Socrates' body was supposed to be left behind as his soul broke. Socrates pointing upward, the, the, the shackles, the chains being on the ground, the poetry that he was writing. There's his, his wife leaving because all the women were kicked out. Uh, that's one of the less um, positive aspects of the dialogue. Women's voices weren't welcome. But Socrates, and this is what these lectures are supposed to recall, um, before his death, he talked about philosophy. And one of the things that he um, that he says, and it's, this seems this seems a really important line to, to bear in mind as um, you read the rest of the, the dialogue, the Phaedo, which is where Socrates' death is recounted. Socrates says to his friends, Simeus and Cebes, that I have good hope that some future awaits men after death, as we have been told for years, a much better future for the good and for the wicked. So I take it that Socrates' talk of hope is significant there and is supposed to frame the discussion that follows. Many people have pointed out, and indeed any undergraduate sort of quickly realizes, that the argument Socrates goes on to give that there is life after death and that it's any good are very, very inconclusive arguments. Um, but it seems significant, indeed many of them are just bad arguments, it seems significant that Socrates has said at the beginning that this is a hope that he has. It doesn't seem, even in his own mind, to be something he can conclusively demonstrate. Um, I take it that one way to read what Socrates is, is, is doing there is expressing a version of what some philosophers call moral faith. And here's what I'm going to understand by moral faith. Now, it's nothing as specific as what Socrates is after. Right? So Socrates is after a very specific idea, that after we die, there is a future. And that in that future, that future is better for good people than for wicked people. That would be a version of the kind of thing that would fall under what I'm calling moral faith. Here I have, here, here is, here's a, a general formula. Moral faith, the idea that we should have moral faith, is the idea that belief in a transcendent order is rationally required by morality. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by some of those terms, specifically transcendent order and some things being rationally required. And then, go, then I'll go on to look at, at a couple of very inconclusive reasons for thinking this might be the case. So first, what do I mean by a transcendent order? Well, let me read a passage from uh, the Constellation of Philosophy, um, a text by a medieval philosopher named um, Boethius. So Boethius is described, so Boethius, like Socrates, has been um, convicted of stupid, trumped up crimes and put to death basically for being a philosopher. And at the beginning of the text, he's complaining about how terrible everything is. So, uh, and this is before philosophy comes and sets him straight. And in the, in the text, there are actually lots of poems that, 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 that express um, um, the narrative of the story. So here's Boethius. He says, in the evening, 
Venus rises bright but loses luster in morning sunrise, playing the role that you, and he's speaking to God, have assigned her. When leaves fall and the cold of winter blows from the north, our days diminish. But then in summer's burgeoning heat, the dark hours of nighttime dwindle as the year fulfills its obligations. Not even the blowing winds are random, but Boreas strips leaves from the trees and Zephyrus brings on gently nurture. The dog star watches as heat beats down on crops in the field, as you two observe and order all from your high office and your certain purpose according to plan. So Boethius is here describing a conception of the material world and the things that happen in the material world as governed by God. The idea is things that happen in the material world make sense. They take place in an orderly way. The seasons change. The days grow longer and shorter. They grow hotter and colder. Leaves fall from the trees. Buds appear. New leaves grow and so on. So that's the way that the material world works. And now he continues. Only, he says, man, human being, is endowed with freedom. Freedom that you, God, could constrain but have chosen not to. And slippery fortune plays for random games with us. The innocent suffer penalties proper to malefactors, and wicked men sit upon thrones. Villains thrive and trample the necks of virtuous men into the mud of calumny and innuendo, where the glow of goodness cannot be glimpsed. They swear falsely and deck themselves in duplicity's gaudy raiment, impressive to gullible crowds that grant them respect. It goes on like this for a while. The idea is that, in contrast to the natural world, where everything is ordered and happens for a reason and makes sense and happens for the good, the world of human affairs isn't like that. In the world of human affairs, the people who are good, who play by the rules, end up where Boethius ends up, in prison, about to be executed. They end up where Socrates ended up. They're powerless. And the people who are powerful on this account are the people who act badly, who, who grab and take power for themselves, and who then are in a position to put someone like Socrates or someone like Boethius to death. The same that's said about power also goes for happiness. The thought that Boethius is expressing is that his having been virtuous, his having been good, has ended him up miserable. Same for Socrates. Look, Socrates, at what your, your noble, virtuous life got you. Here you are dying. right? So, so those who are good are miserable. And in contrast, those who are grasping and ruthless and refuse to play by the rules, they're the ones who end up happy. They're the ones who end up with stuff. They're the ones who end up with power with glory, right, renowned in the eyes of others with all the things that they can want. So, so the idea there is that there isn't this kind of order in the world of human affairs. And so Boethius is despairing. Despairing in the, in, 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 in the face of being, ha having the sense that happiness and virtue are incompatible. And one way to think about what the rest of the text is doing is as a way of trying to convince Boethius that this isn't so. So for example, Lady Philosophy argues that, who's, who's his interlocutor in the text, argues that all these material things that you think make people happy don't make people happy. Or for example, that, or, or again, since we all seek the good, and the good is what we're all seeking, and the way to have real power is to get what you're seeking, therefore those who act badly aren't powerful because they don't get what they're seeking. They get bad instead of good. And everyone who acts well is powerful, maybe despite appearances. So the idea, I take it, that, so that's an expression of what I'm calling um, belief in a transcendent order. Right? Belief that the way things work out in the world isn't just a matter of impersonal natural laws. Right. It also isn't just a matter of human choices. So what I mean when I say transcendent order, I mean something that transcends human choices and natural laws, but is operative in the world in some manner. Now, lots of different things could count as a transcendent order in that sense. One would be Socrates' belief in an afterlife and pagan gods who reward the good, and so on. Another might be Socrates maybe more serious belief, not in pagan gods, but in the forms, right? 
Another example of belief in a transcendent order would be a Christian conception of God, right, or, a, or, or other theist conceptions of God. Another way of thinking about a transcendent order would be karma. Right? Karma taken seriously is the idea that you get what's coming to you, right? So that in some sense, Socrates for his noble life is going to get what's coming to him, Boethius is going to get what's coming to him, and those who have treated him badly are going to get what's coming to them as well. That's what I mean when I talk about a transcendent order. This is very, very general. Again, I'll give the formulation. Belief in a transcendent order is belief that what governs the universe is, or what happens in the universe, I'll just say, what happens in the universe is more than just a combination of impersonal natural laws and human choices. You might think that human choices are also just a matter of impersonal natural laws. Right? Um, okay. So moral faith is the idea that belief in a transcendent order is rationally required by morality. So what do I mean by rationally required? I don't mean that if there isn't this transcendent order, then morality is all false. Like, so some people think things like this, or say they think things like this. Like, if there were no God, then, then there would be no good and bad. I mean, that's hard to believe, right? It seems like we have pretty good evidence that like you shouldn't just torture babies for fun. Right? And you don't need, that would be true whether or not God said it was so. Right? Indeed, if God said it wasn't so, then God would be wrong. Right? So when I say that, that's not, what I, that's not the idea that I have in mind. Another thing that some people think is that if you don't have belief in something transcendent, then you're just going to be a bad person. But that's clearly not true either, or at least highly contestable. So I don't mean either of those things. So now what I have written for myself is, what instead I mean by rationally required um, will become clear as I go forward. <laughs> I'm not going to say now what instead I mean by rationally required. I'm just going to say I don't mean either of those things. OK. So here are two very um, imprecise lines of reasoning for thinking that belief in a transcendent order is rationally required by morality. So here's one. And both of these are lines of thought that many other better philosophers have put um, forward and that many other better philosophers have rejected. So I'm not saying anything original here. Um, indeed, I was just looking back this morning at um, I mean, I'll talk a little bit, right, I've talked about a couple of philosophers who gave arguments like this, but I was just looking back today at this the paper by Robert Mary Hugh Adams, just called Moral Faith, that was published like 20 years ago. It's a really good paper, graduate students, if you want to read a really good paper and be reminded of how to write a really good paper, it's a very, very good paper. Um, and, and, and in looking at Adams' paper again, I realized I have nothing new to say. Um, nor do I necessarily have anything very good to say. Um, Okay, but so here's these, two, here's these two lines of thought. So here's one. The first line is, like, everyone desires to be happy. And, in, and indeed, everyone desires to be perfectly happy. And not just we desire that we be perfectly happy, but we also desire that others be perfectly happy, or at least some, that's something that we should desire. I think this is something that morality demands that we should desire, that we and others be perfectly happy. Now, what do I mean when I say that we desire this? I don't mean that we walk around with like a burning feeling in our chest, like I need perfect happiness, right? But rather the thought is that when at any moment we reflect on how things are going, we see that there are ways in which they could be better, right? We see that there's something imperfect, and we seek a, a, a greater satisfaction. Well, that's gonna, that, that way of putting it already ties into the next um, claim in this line of reasoning which is to say that this desire for a perfect form of happiness can't be satisfied just as things are. Right? Now, you might think, well, of course it can. I mean, I've had moments when I've been like perfectly happy, you might think, when I've just been totally satisfied with how things are going. Right? A natural reply there is, yeah, I've had moments, and then they've passed. Right? And of course, being perfectly happy would mean not just being happy for a moment, but not having it taken away, not even needing to fear that it would be taken away. That's what a kind of perfect satisfaction would be. Okay, so this was the thought so far. 
we desire this kind of perfect, fully satisfying form of happiness, both for ourselves and other people. I want you to be that happy also. Maybe not as much as I want it for me. I think that probably reflects poorly on me. Right? There's some people I want it for more than others. Right? But I want me and you to have this perfect kind of happiness. But I don't think that that kind of happiness can be satisfied as things are. After all, conditions of scarcity, uh, just the tenuousness of, 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 of life. We gain things and we lose them. We get sick. You think you're perfectly happy and then someone gets hit by a bus. I mean, come on, right? You have things that make you happy. You take them away from someone else. Maybe it's not quite zero sum, but sometimes it's pretty close. So this desire can't be satisfied with things as they are. But now it doesn't seem rational to desire things that we can't have. Or maybe more, maybe better. It doesn't seem rational to act on the basis of a desire that's for things we can't have. If you do something out of a desire for something that's impossible for you to attain, it seems like there's something irrational in your doing it. Well, if that's right, if it's true that we all have this desire, and that this desire can't be satisfied just with things as they are, just with human choices and material reality, and it would be irrational to act on this desire if it couldn't be satisfied, then it seems like having this desire, or at least acting on it, requires belief that it can be satisfied, which requires belief in an order other than this one. Now, there's a few things that can be said about this argument. And, and I suppose there's supposed to be a question and answer. I don't know how long I put um, One is you might, just, you might question whether we desire this perfect happiness. You might question whether we should desire this perfect happiness. I'm kind of suggesting lines of, lines of discussion. The other thing that, 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 that one could say that doesn't strike me as, it's certainly not totally wrong about this line of reasoning, would be to say, look, so, so, so this is, I think, what students have said to me when I've, when I've discussed texts that, that, that argue in this way. Right? Isn't there this phrase about, like, if you shoot for the stars, you'll land on the moon? Right? So when people say things like that, it makes me want to, like, <laughs> gouge my eyes out with a spoon. But, 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 right? Okay, so there's, there, there's some truth. There's some truth that that um, slogan is very approximately getting at, right? Which is that sometimes it helps to push yourself really, really, really hard, even if you're not going to get what you're pushing yourself for, right? But for the sake of getting something less, right? So, you know, if you want to be a really, really good basketball player, right, maybe it would help to form the desire to play basketball in the NBA, even if you're, you're just not going to do it. Right? It's not going to happen for you. Might be that forming the desire to play in the NBA and then chasing after that desire will be really, really good in helping you be a good basketball player. So you might think here about happiness, about your own happiness and others' happiness. Having this desire for your own perfect satisfaction, others' perfect satisfaction, might be reasonable to be motivated by that desire, even if the desire is in fact for something that's impossible. I, I find that certainly a, 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 a position worth exploring. Um, you might on the other, I mean, it seems like one thing you could say in reply here is that the reason why it helps to form these out of proportion desires these desires for impossible things is precisely because we are irrational, right? Precisely because, um, uh, right, it's precisely because we are irrational, because sometimes it, it takes an irrational desire to motivate us to do what's good, right? Um, that's not going to get us out of the, the, the argument where the argument says that, that this is a rational requirement. Um, and in any case, I'd be happy to come back to that conversation. I'm not extremely wedded to either of these lines of reasoning. So that was one, right? So again, the idea was that if you desire this perfect kind of happiness, and this perfect kind of happiness is something you seek actively in, 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 in the choices that you make, then it seems like you better at least believe that this desire is for something that's possible. 
And similar, you might, I might say something similar about the MBA case. I suppose we can let me come back to that for a minute too, right? It seems like in order really to get yourself to seek the MBA career, right, you better not just desire it, but you better believe that it's possible. You better talk yourself into believing that it's possible. Now that doesn't make it possible, right? It's just not possible for me, right? I'm just too small, too skinny, too old, right? But if I want to make myself into the best basketball player I can, right? It seems like, and, and this is the desire I'm going to use, it seems like I better believe that desire is for something attainable. Strikes me as a better response than the first one I gave. So here too, in order to seek actively after this, you have to believe that it's something attainable. But you can't believe that it's something attainable if you believe that all there is is human choices and, and, and material forces, because those are never going to make everybody happy. Right? Maybe you deny that those aren't going to make everybody happy, but I'm saying you're really, really optimistic. I have this, I marked a passage from Thomas Aquinas where he talks about this. He says, he says, um, um, well, I mean, whatever. He says obvious things like, yeah, you get something good, it gets taken away. You get something good, you want more. Right? You get something good, someone else doesn't have it. Life is imperfect, just as it is. That's the first line of thought. Here's the second. It's actually very, very different than the first one. And I think it's more maybe at stake in, in which it's also at stake for someone like Bowie Hughes. So another thing you might think is that morality requires a kind of courage. And this is going to be contentious. In particular, you might think morality requires a, a kind of courage in the face of terrible consequences. That even when you face really seemingly terrible consequences for yourself or for loved ones or for just some other people or for some non-people, some portion of the world, sometimes you need to just bite down on those consequences and accept them in order to do the right thing. So morality in that sense requires courage. I mean, I, I could give various um, examples here. Right. Maybe, and this is a contentious example, and maybe that makes it useful for these purposes. But take, you know, the position of someone deciding, you know, suppose the, suppose the terrorists show up and say, we've rigged a building to blow up, and we're only going to tell you where the bomb is if you, if you take some small child and, and torture it terribly for hours and hours and hours. Right? And you really don't think that you can find where this bomb is in any other way. Right? Many of us think that morality requires that you not torture that child for hours and hours and hours. Even though, it seems, there's going to be really, really terrible consequences from making that decision. I suppose you could turn it on its head and go the other way around. If you think that morality requires, um, requires you to torture it. That's actually very hard for me to wrap my mind around that position. But I understand that a lot of Respectable people, otherwise respectable people. <laughs> okay. So, look, um, um, it doesn't seem that controversial to say that morality requires courage. Courage in the face of terrible consequences. Um, but now here again, there's, there's, there's a, so, so now the argument runs in a similar way. It's, it's at least very difficult, and maybe altogether irrational, but I'll say at least very difficult, to, to do or refrain from doing something if you believe that the upshot of that is just simply going to be terrible. Right? Um, well, that, I mean, that's the, that's the intuition that I was just trying to push a minute ago. And so now, think, well, what would be required to sustain the belief that doing the right thing isn't going to lead to terrible consequences? Or that doing the wrong thing isn't going to lead to the best consequences. Well, here again, it's not clear that, um, that I mean, there, there are things that one can say, right? But work needs to be done to show how that view, right? the view that happiness and human, human well-being and so on, and the well-being of the rest of the world are always promoted by good choices and always harmed by bad choices. It doesn't seem to be just built into the structure of human choices in the natural world. 
in a lot of ways, the natural world is indifferent to precisely those kinds of considerations. And human beings certainly very often are indifferent to those kinds of considerations. So believe that there's something more operative in the world than human choices and those kinds of natural forces would seem at least very helpful. So that's the second thought. Now, here again, there, there I'm going to suggest some objections. I'm going to suggest some objections, and then I'm going to ask a very general question, and then I'm going to stop. So one thing you might think is that this kind of this courage that I'm talking about is just stupidity, right? You might think that um, no, really, what 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 morality requires is going with the best consequences, right? And being 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 willing to do even things that seem really bad in search of good consequences. I think that if you take that line about morality, um, you have a very, very problematic moral view, um, but you might be able to resist getting this right off the ground. Um, th the second thought, which I think is more, um, is more um, apt, is that you might think, you might, you might respond that but the whole point of thinking about morality in this way is precisely that we're supposed to not care about consequences. Right? Moral courage means not caring about consequences. And so, and so thinking, oh, everything's going to work out for the best, right, would seem to be precisely s skipping the kind of courage that really being moral. It's not, that, it's not clear to me that that's right. I mean, it seems like morality cares Maybe demands not caring about the consequences for me. Um, maybe. Maybe it demands that. It's not so clear that it demands not caring about the consequences for you, for others. So I think there's, 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 there's room for back and forth. The last thing, and this is going to then lead into the last question I want to answer about this whole line of thought, which I find really interesting. Um, the last question is, look, um, so I said something like that. That believing in, in a transcendent order is required to sustain the belief that morality promotes the good and immorality promotes the bad. Right? But now you might think, sure, but what if that belief is false? I mean, if there isn't a transcendent order, right? if there isn't any transcendent reality, right? then it seems like believing such a thing and acting upon such a thing would make you really, really, really irresponsible. So a moral choice comes up, and 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 you 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 discern what you take to be the relevant virtue or the relevant moral principle, right? And you see that these seemingly terrible consequences are gonna are gonna follow, and you say something like, "Yeah, but karma is gonna take care of it," right? To someone who doesn't believe in karma, you look really 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 irresponsible, right? Or God's gonna take care of it, or it'll all be settled in the afterlife. If those things are false, then they're really, really, really irresponsible things to believe. And they would lead us to act in really irresponsible ways. So that leads to just the last general point that I want to make about these styles of argument, moral faith arguments, which is I think there's a big question about the perspective from which they're supposed to be evaluated, and in particular, whom they're supposed to persuade. Right? If you think that talk of Trans of a transcendent moral order is bunk, right? To put it politely, right. you're probably not going to be persuaded by any of these arguments. Maybe because you're not going to be persuaded by the conception of morality or the conception of rationality that they rest on, right? or maybe because you're going to you're going to um, break with the dialectic at some other point. So it's not clear that these arguments can be or should be persuasive in a certain sort of way. On the other hand, um, it might be, that that's not to say that these arguments have no rational force. Because for one thing, you might think that, even if you think they're not going to persuade the uncommitted, they at least might have rational force of fortifying those already committed. Right? Because of course, if you're already committed to a certain conception of the universe and to a certain conception of the morality of morality, then seeing how they're mutually supportive can strengthen you in both. Now there again, whether or not you think it's good for someone 
to be strengthened in both of those views, kind of moral picture and a, and a picture of the, the order of the world, is going to depend on whether you think that that moral view and that picture of the world are true. Right? There's not some fully dispassionate perspective, I think, from which these kinds of arguments can be evaluated. But they seem still to have some philosophical import. That's what I was going to say. I hope I did that right. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, didn't want to, I wasn't here to watch the ones on Friday. That's all I have to say. All right, we're going to do a few minutes of Q&A. Um, we can save the first two questions for undergrads, so and then anybody undergrads will be free for all. But first two questions. So uh, I'm going to throw out a candidate for what might be a transcendent moral order, and you can say whether it is one or isn't and why. Um, suppose that I'm a transhumanist, so I think that it would be possible to modify the human species so that you know humans won't come to die, they'll be capable of something like per uh, perfect happiness and eternal longevity. Uh, due as a result of modification of the human species. Right. Now, if I believe that that were possible, would that be uh, fulfilling, you know, the the belief in the rational, uh, sorry, in the transcendent moral order, or not? That's that's really good. Um, I mean, um, so it wouldn't meet the so it wouldn't meet the definition that I had in my or the kind of thing I had in mind with my with my definition. Um, now, you know, I said natural laws and human choices. Now, maybe these, in, in this transhuman world, they would be transhuman choices. Um, but I suppose that's still the kind of thing I would have in mind. So it seems like this is also just a way of resisting one of, one of the original arguments, right? I mean, so, so this could go in one of two ways, right? One would be, I could say, this is a kind of moral faith. The other thing I could do would be to take this to be challenging the question whether, without what I have in mind with the transcendent moral order, a certain kind of happiness isn't um, isn't possible, right? So this transhuman order would be um, would not involve the, the relevant kind of transcendence, but still would make everybody happy. I suppose I am not that optimistic about <laughs> about. Um, uh, transhuman scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, again, that I think is is evident for the kind of point that I was making at the end. That how you evaluate these kinds of arguments um, isn't um, irrespective of your other um, um, of, of how you evaluate some of the particular positions involved, the particular moral position the particular uh, conceptions of human happiness, right? Your transcendent world doesn't sound very good to me, but karma doesn't sound very good to me either, and Socrates' life after death might, sound, might not sound very good to you, right? So, um, but yeah, I don't think that that would fit the bill, because that would be the kind of, the kind of order that would be brought about by human choices, right? It would still be the product of human choices. It's also not clear that it would be satisfying. I mean, we only get to that order by, like, um, a lot of uh, like pulling minerals up out of the ground and making people work really hard for very little money and, and things like this, right? That's what's required to make that that, that order possible. Arguably. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And that's that's a very good question. Others? Yeah. Oh wait, here's an undergrad. Um. Wouldn't like his examples such as Gandhi, MLK, Jesus, be figures of people who uh, would very well align with the whole notion of that perfect happiness and that they're trying to go on this moral path and they have this grandiose vision at the time of, you know, in odds and ideas where those ideas are completely, completely out of the blue. Um, wouldn't that be kind of like the case as far as evidence to further back that up? Good. So there might be like 
there might be nice um, inductive evidence here, right? Something like look at these, you know, particular cases of of real moral courage or morally admirable lives. They're all sustained by the they're all sustained by a conviction that has a, a general, you know, certain very general shape. Now I think now of course one problem is someone wants to you know there's a, there's a natural reply which is um, couldn't there be some other cases of someone who um, had the had the the requisite moral commitments but lacked this belief um, and maybe you can point to real life cases that fit that model um, and so part of the argument here is is part of the force of saying that it's rationally required. The idea would be that it's not just like psychologically helpful, right, or causally connected, but that there's some kind of uh, per se connection between them, and and that isn't that's going to be maybe supported but only weakly by particular cases. Is that does that seem right to you? I mean, like one of the things that I'm trying to clarify that I was trying to figure out also is like how rational is applied. Like, are talking about rational as in like that connection or how realistic can these circumstances coincide in the actual world? Right. So, I mean, I have in mind something like what philosophers today call, I mostly what I, mostly what I'm going to is what philosophers, what philosophers call practical rationality. Right, so practical rationality would be, you know, the rationality of acting in certain ways, right, given things you believe and things and so on. And so the claim is that absent a certain belief, but given a certain desire, say, acting in certain ways would be practically irrational. Right? So that's what I have in mind by, by irrationality. That was really, those are very, very good questions. Another question? I feel I did it wrong. Um, I, hate take, I always hate taking my own questions, Adam. I guess um, I just kind of had, um, I was kind of related to his question too about the rationality question because uh, practical rationality seems to have some commitments to um, kind of a consequentialist type picture. I'm trying to, you know, perform these means to get to a particular end, whether that end is, you know, infinite happiness or um, infinite happiness for others, which I'm willing to die for or, or, or whatever. And, um, and so, you know, I don't know whether that, I mean, the faith comes in because I don't know whether that end is going to come to pass for me performing this means, and this means might be really detrimental to me or to other people that I love. And I, and I wonder about, I mean, is there any room, I wonder if there's room for like a deontological picture of morality with, without appealing to this kind of a moral salvation, because I feel like the moral salvation picture keeps pulling back to like a consequentialist, you know, idea of, you know, the consequences of I'm doing this action not because it's the right thing, okay. but because the right thing brings about the guys. Great, good, okay, That's, this, these, are really, these are really helpful questions. So, so right at the beginning when I said here are some things I didn't want to argue, and one of them was that um, if, if, if God doesn't exist, then like, you can just do whatever you want. Um, and another one was that, um, um, if you don't, if you don't have this kind of belief, then you're then you're just going to inevitably be a bad person or worse than people do. There's like probably pretty good inductive evidence that that's false. Um, um, though, like, um, but yeah, another one is is that I don't want to be saying that like everything you do you should do because someday you'll you'll be alive afterward and you want things to be good then, right? That would be a, that would be that would be selfish, right? To think that way. Now it should be said that you know among the many um, philosophers who've given arguments of this sort, one of them was Kant, who was decidedly not a consequentialist and and had as like bare a deontological view. So a deontological view of morality is that what matters is moral principles, what matters is the moral law, and not consequences. And Kant thought that sustaining that conception of morality did require exactly this kind of stuff, indeed like a really big grand version of it. Now that's only inductive support for the thesis. Um, um, I don't think that practical rationality can ever be 
not in some degree calculative as it's said. Now that don't I don't think that that makes it I don't think that that requires collapsing practical rationality with instrumental rationality or making it all reduced to questions about consequences. So for example, if I I might calculate I might reason practically as follows. Um, um, you know, if I don't do such and such, that would make me a bad father. So I should do it, right? So that's a form of means end calculation, right? I calculate that I should do such and such because I should be a good father, right? It's not clearly consequentialist in the in the relevant in, in the in the specific sense of consequentialist. Right? Um, we could get into the business of defining, and that would be I think a good task. Um, Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's it's it's, ca it's calculative rationality, um, and I think it's those kinds of stands on principle, right, that often are real, that often are most important. Seeing that it just wouldn't be fitting for me to act in a certain kind of way, say as a father or as a teacher, right, something wouldn't be fitting. Um, but now the question: Why should I do what's fitting as opposed to what's immediately gratifying or what has certain kinds of good consequences? Raises exactly the kind of yeah. Uh, so you mentioned here then that you know there's a conception of morality, a conception of rationality that all leads to the rational requirement of some transcendent order. But I'm wondering, if someone wants to deny that 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 follow through to the rational requirement, are they giving up something in of their conception of morality and their conception of rationality? I mean, if these things, those two things, hold in a certain way that makes this follow. If you want to say, I don't believe in these orders, I don't want to have this as my overarching picture, are they losing something in those first two requirements? I mean, I think that, that, that something like that will be, so, something like that, um, um, give and take, is, is clearest with the first argument. It's like, look, either you reject this desire for perfect happiness, or you think that it's satisfiable without that or you deny that it's irrational to seek after things that you believe are impossible. Um, um, yeah, so you know, either something that's part of your conception of morality, in, in the very broad sense of morality, something you seek, happiness, that in, in light of which you structure the choices you make, goes, or you change your conception of what it requires, or you think that you could seek after something that you just that you believe is not possible. Um, the loss of those things really, really strikes me as not a very, a very credible move. Um, and so it seems like, but yeah, I, right? Either your, um, either the conception of, of, of transcendent order has to change, or the conception of morality has to change, or the conception of the, the, the kind of linking premise about practical rationality has to be challenged. So I would think about it, and I think there was something similar in another case. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about color. Yeah. So when you're talking about moral courage, I'm right, talking sure. about going to go on and talk about you know, Socrates and Boethius right. being prepared to die for their belief. Good. Good. Uh, yeah, uh, you actually talk about a different that. kind of courage, right. which is, as it were, uh, sticking to some moral principle even when you suspect there might be very good reasons for abandoning it. Yeah. Right. And those just seem to me. Right. Different, right? So, one of the thoughts that people have is not just, look, if I lived a good life, you know, I might end up in a bad spot. It is, as it were, that if there isn't a transcendent order, then in a way, Socrates and Boethius didn't get what should be done to them. Right, right, right. So, there's as if there's something wrong with the world in right. rewarding people. The other is, um, what might sustain you if you were a certain kind of deontologist? Right. Good. So, so it's, yeah. you know, you don't have to be a deontologist in right. to think as a transcendent. Right. Model. Right. Good. So, yeah, and I think at some point in what I was saying, I tried to switch from the one way of thinking about it to the other. So I think the, 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 the picture you suggest is more plausible. The idea that, there's um, so a question, is acting well, gonna, is living well going to serve my happiness? Um, um, is virtue going to make me happy? And um, it seems like a perfectly fair, non-selfish question to ask. 
seems like a, a question we ask inescapably. And there can be, but, but, but there can be courage required to say, even though it's just totally not obvious how this is going to contribute to my happiness, nevertheless, it's the right choice. And society drinks the poison. Why the hell are you drinking poison instead of just escape from prison? When he could have, and you decided to follow, I, don't, I never taught that in my intro classes because I never understood. Right? Okay, but that's, that's another question, right? Um, um, that's another question. Um, you know, another relevant case that comes that, that I've that I've used in this context is that of someone like Thomas More, right? Thomas More having to say, "Look, no, I'm just I'm, I'm the king is wrong, right? And I'm going to say the king is wrong, even if it leads to these terrible consequences for me." Um, now, I wouldn't want to describe the other kind of case as one where you stick to some moral principle despite having good evidence that it's wrong. <laughs> um, I would want to, I would want to say something like, um, right? And I use the language of principles, but. You know, you, you, you refuse to do something vicious, <laughs> um, and, and you're not. You refuse to let yourself be tempted by fear of consequences into doing something vicious. That would be my only preferred way of thinking about it. Um, but I agree; those are different. Those are different cases because, in the one case, the relevant kind of courage has to do with consequences for me, and in the other case, uh, or outcomes for me, and in the other case, it has to do with outcomes maybe for others. Um, and yeah, you might get kind of different answers.